Secret negotiations in the Middle East are always going on behind the scenes. And now, part of a blockbuster deal reportedly is taking place at a furious pace. Plans to normalize relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia. The Saudis claim to want a diplomatic breakthrough for the Palestinians. There's a plan reportedly being floated that might be acceptable to Israel with the United States as mediator. That's according to White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. He said all the parties involved have a general idea of the major elements of a potential agreement between Jerusalem and Riyadh, and negotiations are reportedly fairly advanced. We'll discuss what all of this means for Bible prophecy today, and we'll also look into other pressing topics, including archaeological affirmations of the Bible and the Holy Land, Bible prophecy and technology, persecution of Christians, and maintaining divine health in perilous times. The Jerusalem Channel is made with the support of you, our viewers. Thank you for watching. Shalom, I'm Christine Dark. It's not a new idea, but merging the Palestinians into the nation of Jordan is supposedly a plan favored by the Saudis, according to a Prophecy Newswatch article by Michael Snyder. The new entity would include present-day Jordan, Gaza, and the West Bank, all areas populated by Palestinian Arabs. The strategy is that Israel might agree to this if Palestinians were to relinquish all claims to Israel's historic capital, Jerusalem. This potential scenario was floated in an editorial published in the Times of Israel saying that Gaza and the West Bank should be demilitarized and incorporated into the nation of Jordan, perhaps the West Bank first and Gaza sometime later. And as suggested elsewhere, Jordan would update its name to reflect this territorial union, a name such as the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan and Palestine. Of course, as Snyder wrote, all of this speculation is tentative because so many things can change. There's also talk of an international aid program similar to the Marshall Plan for Europe after World War II to bolster the economy of Jordan while integrating the Palestinians into the expanded Hashemite Kingdom. While the deal could fail, if this normalization agreement between Saudi Arabia and Israel does go forward, it will, of course, have enormous implications. How might such an accord fulfill Bible prophecy? Well, carving up the Holy Land brings God's displeasure, as he clearly stated in Joel chapter 3, verse 2. He said, I will gather the armies of the world into the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will enter into judgment against them concerning my people, my inheritance Israel, whom they have scattered amongst the nations, and for dividing up, partitioning my land. In Daniel chapter 9, a timeline of events is given in which a covenant is confirmed or guaranteed for seven years. The signing of such a peace accord could potentially begin the seven-year time known in Bible prophecy as Jacob's trouble or the tribulation period. Think about this. The majority of events in the book of Revelation take place during this future seven-year period. It will be yet another sign that Jesus is returning very soon if an accord is brokered by the future Antichrist. The Saudis also have their own vision. They call it Vision 2030, which is similar to the UN's Agenda 2030. The Saudis are building an eco-friendly city called The Line, similar to the concept of 15-minute cities where everything needed is within a 15-minute walk or bike ride, eliminating the need for a car. But of course, freedom will be greatly curtailed in order to protect the climate from carbon emissions. 
The Jerusalem Post recently published an article headline, Don't Let Saudis Have Any Role on the Temple Mount. Put Israel in Charge. This is because behind-the-scenes talks have included the possibility of granting some sort of official status to Saudi Arabia on the Temple Mount. Presently, Jordan holds a custodian status, and it's erratic, but the Israelis have allowed it to try to maintain peace, despite having won back their Temple Mount in the Six-Day War. Another article suggests that a high-speed rail will bring pilgrims from Saudi Arabia to the Temple Mount, known to them as the Noble Sanctuary, by 2040. Prime Minister Netanyahu announced a $27 billion plan to link Israel by train to Saudi Arabia. Many Jewish people believe this would be a sign of the coming Messiah, whom they're still expecting for the first time. But he would be a figure most likely to be either the Antichrist or the false prophet of the book of Revelation. Saudi Arabia was also invited to be part of BRICS, an international group of world economies that ultimately would be controlled in the future by a global world leader. A Reuters article was headlined, Saudi Arabia Eyes World Stage After BRICS Invitation. Well, meanwhile, archaeologists in Israel continue to make bombshell discoveries. Many confirm important details of biblical accounts. For example, Dr. Scott Stripling is the director of excavation at Biblical Shiloh, and during an interview with the Jerusalem Channel, he shared evidence that we were actually standing where quite possibly the tabernacle once stood. This area at Shiloh, known as the Tabernacle Plateau, is sufficiently large enough to house the tabernacle courtyard. There are a series of holes in the bedrock that could have supported the post of the Mishkan, the tabernacle. I believe there needs to be a news outlet called Archaeological Times of Israel, just to keep pace with all the findings and happenings. For example, the Israel Antiquities Authority has announced that the ancient pool of Siloam, first mentioned in the Bible in 2 Kings, is to be fully excavated and open to the public. Eight steps have been uncovered leading to the pool of Siloam, which is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, where a man blind from birth was healed. The eight steps have not seen the light of day for approximately 2,000 years. Zaev Orenstein, director of international affairs at the ancient city of David, said that the half mile from the Pool of Siloam leading up to the southern steps of the Temple Mount represents the most significant half mile on this planet. The Pool of Siloam is fed by the waters of the Gihon Spring, one of the four rivers that flowed out of the Garden of Eden, according to Genesis 2.13. During the Second Temple period, pilgrims probably used the pool as a ritual bath, called in Hebrew a mikveh, before ascending to the Temple Mount through what archaeologists have dubbed the Pilgrimage Road. And this was the city of David's main street, leading directly to the sanctuary, the same route that Jesus and Jewish pilgrims walked 2,000 years ago. While archaeology confirms the past, the future is also predicted in the Bible. Day by day, technology moves us closer to a one-world government that will be controlled by a future figure called the Antichrist for a short period of time. Students of Bible prophecy have long warned that our society is marching towards acceptance of technology described right in the book of Revelation. In fact, Revelation 13 foretells a time in which a mark in the right hand or forehead will be used as both a symbol of identification with the Antichrist and also a means to conduct business. Without that mark, no one will be permitted to buy or sell. Meanwhile, the European Union is calling for world leaders to roll out digital IDs in a cashless society by 2030. In some countries, digital identification has already been implemented for government services and online banking. However, expanding the use of digital IDs to cover all online activities 
would be a significant step towards global ID for everybody. While it might seem to make sense on some levels, the threat is vast to personal freedoms and potential government abuse. In the same way that digital currency provides authorities ability to track and record every online financial transaction, digital ID will provide the same data for every click that's made online. This would put global control over the flow of information into the hands of a very few individuals. And then so-called misinformation would be blocked, and as conservatives have already learned, traditional biblical values would be censored. Europe has already taken the first step towards such restrictions with the Digital Services Act, which can fine or ban persons for offenses. The United Nations has made no secret of its plans to have a global digital ID as part of its sustainable development goals. But now here's some good news. According to a Washington Stan article, a growing number of parents in the United States are removing their students from public schools and enrolling them in private institutions. This is a reaction to the coronavirus pandemic, which caused widespread and lengthy public school shutdowns and vaccine requirements that proved to be immensely controversial. Among the private schools that have seen substantial growth are classical Christian schools, which instill students with a biblical worldview. Since 2020, reportedly 1.2 million American students have been withdrawn from public schools, and many are enrolling in private schools. Classical education is all about getting back to the basic building blocks of education that were established for centuries within the church. According to David Goodwin, president of the Association of Classical Christian Schools, a biblical worldview is the primary function of a classical Christian education. Goodwin said it's his hope and prayer that in this cultural climate where issues are so challenging and where so many evil turn of events are going on in the public sphere, he hopes that parents will support education aiming to bring children to a saving knowledge of the Lord. That's some good news in the West, but in parts of Africa and in the East, persecution against Christians continues. Vast multitudes have been killed and hundreds of churches have been burned in recent months. If you live in the Western world, you may not have heard about some of these massacres because news is tightly controlled by a handful of powerful corporations. Instead, the West has fed plenty of photos of degenerate celebrities and so forth, while Christians are being slaughtered in Manipur State in India. According to a Prophecy Newswatch article, UN experts have appealed to India's government over the ongoing violence in Manipur State, which has left 187 dead and 70,000 displaced and hundreds of churches destroyed amid ethnic and religious tensions. India's government has deployed tens of thousands of soldiers to the region, but they've not been able to completely stop the violence. According to official estimates, mobs have looted more than 4,000 weapons and half a million rounds of ammunition from police in Manipur. Some of our pastoral associates in Mumbai have gone on several relief missions to Manipur to help the churches there, but this is not the only area of India where persecution is happening. Many Indians just deeply resent the fact that Christianity has spread so rapidly in recent years, and the level of persecution continues to grow with each passing year. Mobs have also rampaged through Christian communities in Pakistan, burning churches and terrorizing believers. The Luton International Fellowship in the UK, which is pastored by the chairman of Exploits Ministry, has been sending relief to our suffering brethren in Pakistan. Elsewhere, Armenian Christians are once again also being persecuted. The U.S. government is being asked to intervene to prevent the genocide of 120,000 Armenian Christians by the Islamic government of Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan has blockaded the only road connecting the enclave of Christians to Armenia, and the approximately 120,000 Armenian residents have been severed from essential goods, including food, electricity, 
life-saving medication and other health care. A coalition of global organizations announced the launch of a campaign dedicated to ending the Azerbaijani blockade of the Armenian territory and ending the persecution of the Christians who had been trapped in their own country. Friends, you see, we are living in increasingly dangerous times. As the Apostle Paul wrote, in the last days, perilous times will come. As I pointed out previously, that word perilous means fierce. It's the same word used in the Greek New Testament to describe the demonized man living amongst the tombs whom Jesus healed and delivered. So in a time when medical tyranny is increasingly becoming an issue of great concern, divine healing is a topic that we need to meditate upon daily and bring into the core of our biblical worldview. The globalists want us dependent upon big pharma, but I'm reminded again that the New Testament refers to the Greek word for pharmacy as sorcery in Revelation 18.32. It says, For by thy sorceries were all the nations deceived. Of course, this verse is not to condemn all medications, and this program should not be considered as medical advice. In fact, we thank God for many of the wonders of modern medicine. However, the Bible does teach and promote divine health, and this subject should not be neglected by believers in Christian TV channels. Many people, including many professing Christians, believe their bodies belong to them to use as they please. They haven't grasped the meaning of 1 Corinthians 6.13, which says the body is for the Lord. Now, what did the Apostle Paul mean by that? He taught that we must learn to manage our bodies morally and to eat and drink to the glory of God. Consider the fact that by eating forbidden fruit, that's how sin entered the world. And it was through food that Esau despised and forfeited his birthright. The devil sought to tempt Jesus with food. So when we fail to watch over, to discipline, and to restrain our bodies from indulging in any kind of sin, whether it's overeating, drugs, alcohol, etc., we render our bodies unfit for the service of God. Everything concerning the body's maintenance should be placed under the leadership of the Holy Spirit with much prayer. Paul asked in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, What? Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have received as a gift from God, and that you are not your own property? Just as Jerusalem's temple was constructed solely for God and for His service, even so our bodies under the new covenant are called the temple of the Lord. And so we have been created for the Lord's glory. And we have to take care of these vessels. But the catchphrase of the age has become, my body, my choice. People think they can defiantly tattoo it, resort to abortion as contraceptive, overindulge in food, drugs, alcohol, and so forth without any consequences. Well, according to the classic devotional book, Divine Healing, by Andrew Murray, one of the chief benefits of divine healing is to be set free from the yoke of our own will in order to become the Lord's property. God wants us to come to terms with the fact that we have regarded our bodies as our own property, while actually they belong to whom? To the Lord. That may come as a shock even to some believers in an age of anything goes. But let our motto be, 1 Corinthians 6, 13, the body is for the Lord. As I said, this program should not be mistaken for medical advice. And what I'm sharing is spiritual, and so it's helpful to review this great classic, Divine Healing, by Andrew Murray. And it's readily available free on the Internet, chapter by chapter. He wrote that the Bible does not authorize us to believe that the gifts of healing were granted only to the early church. Unfortunately, a lot of preachers teach the cessation of ministry gifts after the early church was established. They erroneously claim that the gifts of God finished when the church was established. But on the contrary, the promises for healing in this Bible 
are applicable to all times. Jesus did not put a time limit on healing the sick. Paul placed the gifts of healing and working of miracles among the operations of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And the Apostle James in chapter 5 gave a precise command in his book on this matter of healing without any time restriction. The entire scriptures declare that healing grace will be granted according to the measure of the Spirit and our faith. The church needs to hear clearly announced that it's on account of worldliness and unbelief that she has lost these spiritual gifts of healing and that the Lord restores these gifts to those who have consecrated their lives to him with faith and obedience. Now, also, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 13, the body is for the Lord and the converse is true. It says the Lord is for the body. Yes, that verse proclaims the body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. Notice the reciprocity. In the measure that I surrender to him, in that measure also he gives himself to me. In saying the body is for the Lord, we express the desire to be consecrated. And by his spirit, the Lord imparts to us his body, his own strength and holiness to strengthen and keep us. This is a divine exchange, and it's a matter of faith. Naturally, our bodies are weak and mortal, yet the Lord who died for us says, the Lord is for the body. That's because Jesus took upon himself an earthly body in order to bear our sins on the cross. These words, the Lord is for the body, are applicable to the physical strength which the Lord's service requires of us. David said in Psalm 18, praise God for strength and endurance. On the day the Lord delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies. He said, it is God who arms me with strength and makes my way clear. He makes my feet like hind's feet, the feet of a mountain deer, and he stations me upon the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. Again, in Psalm 27, David said, the Lord is the strength of my life. Many believers have experienced the beautiful promise of increased physical strength referenced in Isaiah 40 in verses 29 to 31. Hear this and be refreshed by it. He gives power to the faint and increases the strength of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles, they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Hallelujah. Therefore, let's give our bodies to the Lord, our healer, to manage them and to maintain them. Always believe that the Lord, as our great physician, has taken charge of our bodies to impart his divine strength and health, and we can draw upon it. One of the most frequently occurring commandments in Scripture is simply, don't be afraid. So in these last days, how do we overcome our fears? How can we live our faith in the midst of a worldwide cultural slide into deception and, let's face it, much insanity going on? How can we walk in peace while a worldwide tyranny is developing, a potential globalist police state where no one will be able to buy or sell if they're not wholly subservient to the elites. How else but by trusting that God is with us and he will deliver us. In fact, the Lord has promised he'll never leave us nor forsake us, even if we're faced with the most difficult circumstances. The antidote to fear is faith in God's love for us and faith in his divine presence. I often think about the Christian martyrs and those who were fed to the lions in Rome's Colosseum. And you know, there's such a thing as dying grace. Recently, I read the account of the missionary to Africa, Dr. David Livingstone, who was attacked in Africa by a ferocious lion. Livingstone lived to tell the story. The beast clenched his jaws on his shoulder and the heavy weight propelled the missionary violently to the ground. He later wrote, 
growling horribly close to my ear, he shook me as a terrier dog shakes a rat. The shock produced a stupor in me similar to that which seems to be felt by a mouse after the first shake of the cat. It was as though Livingston was trapped in a dream in which he wrote, I had no sense of pain or feeling of terror, though I was conscious of all that was happening. The shake annihilated fear and allowed no sense of horror in looking around at the beast. It seemed, he said, a merciful provision by our benevolent creator for how he can lessen the pain of death. Well, it's been said that the exhortation not to be afraid is given 365 times in the Bible. That's a daily reminder from God to live every day fearless as we walk with the Lord. The enemy of our souls wants us to live in dread and to be very afraid. Indeed, he uses fear as his primary weapon against us. But God repeatedly tells us in his word not to be afraid. Don't be afraid of men, of wars, tribulation, pandemics, and yes, don't even be afraid of death itself. As we bring this program to a conclusion, I want to remind you that it's urgent to put your trust in Jesus as he is the world's only Savior, and time is running out before his return. His resurrection from the dead was God's amen to the atoning work that Jesus accomplished for us on Jerusalem's cross. The resurrection was God's vindication on Jesus' claims. As an evangelist of the empty tomb here, I can say with confidence, along with the Apostle Paul in Romans 10, 9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. This is the good news of the gospel. And it's certainly great news for the last days. To keep up with the fast-moving prophetic events in the news, check out our website, exploits.tv, which has all of our videos and reports on end-time events. We invite you to sign up also for our weekly email news alert and at our Jerusalem Channel app, as well as our Jerusalem Channel YouTube site, you can watch our library of videos 24-7. My latest articles can be read and downloaded at my Substack site. Friends, the kingdom of God is at hand. Soon we're going to hear the sound of the shofar and see King Yeshua. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact me on social media. Until next time, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. I pray for wisdom upon all within the sound of my voice. And you know me, I'll always be contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. Shalom, I'm Christine Dart. Maranatha. A new day begins over Jerusalem's Western Wall Plaza, where Jews and Christians from all over the world gather to worship, pray, and petition the God of Israel. The Holy City is a unique mix of tradition, history, and religious fervor that makes it the center of the world. Through your support of the Jerusalem Channel, we're able to present to a global audience a spiritual insight into the Bible and Bible prophecy that will impact your life. Thank you for being part of these programs. To make a gift, visit our website at jerusalemchannel.tv or download our free Jerusalem Channel app where you can donate by credit or debit card. Celebrate with us this ancient capital that will one day soon be the worship center of the Messiah.